Welcome to Chats with the Chief. I'm John Jensen, Chief of Staff at the Veterans Health Administration, and this is the podcast where we make small talk about the largest integrated healthcare system in the country. This week, I'm joined by Dr. Terry Keene, Director of the Behavioral Science Division of the National Center for Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. Enjoy the show. Uh, it's great to have you here. We look forward to a great conversation about your work and what it's done here for our, our nation's veterans. Well, thanks very much, John, and welcome to Boston, the city of champions. <laughs> it's great to be here and look forward to the conversation. So before we get started, we always like to have a conversation to help people get to know you a little bit better, and then we'll talk about your great work that you're doing. And so is there a book, movie, or TV show, or books, movies, and TV shows that you're reading and watching that uh, you'd want to share with our audience? Um, uh, sure. I've been reading several books uh, here lately, and the first is a book about the mother of a very good friend of mine here in Boston. Um, his mother's name was Betty Davis, and the book is called um, Miss D and Me. It's a biography of about the last 10 or 15 years of Betty Davis's life. Um, while she was caretaken by this young woman, Karen Cernak, who um, wrote the book many years after um, Betty Davis passed away. It's a really good that read. That sounds exciting. Very exciting. Uh, the second book that I'm reading is um, by Rachel Maddow, with whom I'm a, um, a very good friend and um, fan. And uh, Rachel's book on the corruption in the oil and the gas industry is called Blowout. And it's a very interesting and detailed investigative reporting of what the problems are in the oil and gas industry internationally. The third book I'm reading is actually sort of a professional uh, book and it's um, actually Homer's Iliad. And uh, the Iliad of course is about the effect of the Trojan Wars on uh, the men. And they were mostly men then, and not so much today. Um, but I think the principles that are espoused in um, Homer's Iliad are relevant um, again today. And, um, a colleague of mine here at the in Boston some 30 years ago um, wrote about how Homer's Iliad actually is represented quite clearly in the psychological suffering of Vietnam theater veterans. And this was Dr. Jonathan Shea, who's now long ago retired. Okay. I can uh, see there might be some comparisons to Homer's Iliad to any of the wars that Absolutely. our nation's veterans have fought in. Absolutely, and it really, <clears throat> it really documents the, um, the history, the longstanding nature of um, understanding and coming to an appreciation of the psychological impact on the people um, who fight in wars. And it was picked up many years later by um, Shakespeare. It was picked up again um, in the Civil War. Soldier's heart was a term used to capture um, the impact of the Civil War on uh, uh, the men, mostly men, who fought it. Um, but then shell shock and um, anxiety and neurosis um, right. um, across the, uh, the decades. Wow, what a varied group of uh, yeah. books that you're reading, but it yeah. uh, keeps you all entertained, I'm very sure. Uh, it does, yeah. 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 Um, so do you have like a hobby or something that you do in your spare time when you're not uh, uh, solving so many great problems in the VA? <laughs> Um, I, I need to work on the hobby dimension of life. Um, I've never been particularly good. Um, I am a very good cook, and I um, um, have worked with and, and observed a number of really terrific chefs who are neighbors of mine, and uh, that's something that I actually spend a lot of time doing is entertaining and cooking and the like. I am also um, have been um, very involved athletically. I, uh, for some 35 years from when I finished graduate school, until the last several years. I ran most every day of the week. Uh, and I saw that as uh, self-care for yeah. people who are involved in what can be very stressful positions. Um, it's not necessarily taking care of patients. It's being an administrator in right. VA. Yeah. <laughs> that can be, no, that yes, can be I know. stressful. Um, <laughs> but that's got to be therapeutic to get out. I, I found yeah. it. And actually, I, yeah. I, I believe that uh, the fact that I can no longer run secondary to asthma, adult onset on asthma, worse yet, um, I, I have actually um, tried to figure out what else I can do. But nothing is really quite as satisfying for me as, no. um, as running was. I know how you feel. Yeah. I also know that I can't run anymore. Um, it's the, uh, uh, the alternative is like um, it's sort of unacceptable, but um, death is not really <laughs> something right. I would look forward to. That's right. I had hoped to run until I was much older, but uh, I did have to stop. Yeah. Is there a lesson or a piece of advice that you've ever gotten that you've never forgotten that you maybe repeat to others or that you I guess, try to live by. I, you know, I, 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 what immediately pops into 
uh, my mind was the director of my graduate training program. I'm a clinical psychologist, John, and the director of my graduate training program. As I was getting ready to transition to going on my internship, which was gonna be at the VA in Jackson, Mississippi, I, I was sort of like looking at him one day and we were chatting and I said, oh, I just can't wait to get an internship because it'll, the pressure will be off. It'll be a lot easier, it'll be just better. And he looked at me and he said, Keen, it only gets worse. And I remember that conversation very, very clearly. And I said, he's just being, you know, cynical or sarcastic or something. And he was right. Yeah. <laughs> Life does get more complicated and there are many more issues to deal with. I actually long for the days of being a graduate student. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great to yeah. go back to those times? Yeah. So maybe you, st you mentioned it a little bit. Maybe tell us about, you know, how you first came to the VA and what research or what work you're doing now in VA. Uh, yeah, great. Um, <clears throat> I was uh, a graduate student at Binghamton University, which is one of the state universities of New York in upstate New York. And um, I um, was going on the uh, completion of our graduate training is a year long program um, called a psychology internship. In my case, it was a residency. And um, I looked at many places in the country and the best place for me was in Jackson, Mississippi, which was very hard right. to convince my parents was yeah. the best place. And, and quite a move <laughs> upstate New York. It was quite a, for a kid who grew up in the yeah. New York City area. And, um, but, but it really was. And the reason it was the best place for me is that it was a very scientifically oriented clinical training program. And that was the model in which I was, tra uh, I was trained in graduate school. And so I went there thinking to myself, well, I can live anywhere for a, a year. Um, and wound up staying there for eight years. And it was a springboard to, you know, frankly, the most remarkable career. So satisfying for me that um, I like to praise both Binghamton University and the University of Mississippi Medical Center and the Jackson VA where I spent virtually all of my time. It was, uh, it, it, it was simply remarkable. And I had trained in the area of substance abuse, in particular alcohol use. Um, and I thought that was going to be the direction of my career. And I began to uh, sort of work with and interview patients on the alcohol and drug units and found myself hearing stories over and over and over again about why people were drinking in these huge quantities, things that sort of shocked me. Mm -hmm. I was 25 years old. I hadn't lived much of a life at that point, except that of a student, which, right. as I've already shared with you, I found very stressful, <laughs> <laughs> um, who knew? Um, and so it, it, it was a remarkable set of, um, of similarities, whether it was combat trauma or um, trauma during the course of training, or perhaps even community violence or um, childhood trauma. And while the word trauma, I don't believe, was ever mentioned in my graduate training program, this was 1977 when I moved to Mississippi, um, I began to pull all of these things together. And with the help of some very supportive psychologists and psychiatrists, um, we began to talk about psychological trauma and war trauma. Um, and there was no scientific literature out there at that time, or, or virtually very little, not, yeah. very little. A lot of it was from World War II, World War I, some from Korea, um, but it was precious little. So uh, that was the beginning. I uh, quickly transitioned from uh, my interest in substance abuse to my interest in psychological trauma. PTSD didn't come along until 1980, and that's when it was included in the diagnostic nomenclature. Um, but for me, um, this all began in 77. That VA hired me um, immediately thereafter, um, and I established one of the very first treatment programs for Vietnam veterans with uh, what turned out to be combat-related PTSD. So this would have been 1978, 79, when, when we started this. And it really was about the first program. There was an inpatient program called the Young Vets Program at the Palo Alto VA. Okay. And, uh, colleague of mine, Fred Dustman, ran it for many, many years. Uh, but we really had the first outpatient um, treatment program for PTSD. Wow. And so how did it kind of evolve from there to really the, the care that we see today and really the focus on PTSD as we know it today? Well, well, this is actually beyond all expectations. 
that I could have ever had about where this would be taken, uh, be taken over time. Um, I do remember somebody uh, working with me at the time said that um, he would accept the job because his dissertation advisor said that, um, well, this whole trauma thing will be good for a few years. So um, this would be a good place to start your career. Mm -hmm. um, I can just tell you that uh, um, my first postdoctoral fellow, John Fairbank, now directs a research center in Durham, VA, and is one of the premier scientists in the field of PTSD. And, um, I think it's probably 40 some odd years since we worked together. So um, it was good for many, many more years of our careers. And the remarkable part about all of this is that uh, the work that we did in those very first years, John Fairbank from Durham and myself, um, has sustained the test of time. Many of the things that we've done are still cited periodically. And many of the instruments that we worked to develop to evaluate people uh, whether it was for exposure to the war zone or, um, or, or how much PTSD does one person have compared to somebody else. Right. You right. know, th these are things that, um, that we established very early in the 1980s and continue to be approaches that are taken nationwide and even internationally. It's a very exciting and very encouraging. It's very interesting. And so it's been called many different things, shell shock, battle fatigue, et cetera. But maybe you can describe what is PTSD, um, because not, maybe not everyone would know what that is. Right. If you're a mental health professional, yeah. you certainly know. And if you're working in VA, you certainly know. But uh, P PTSD is a very disabling condition. Um, once you pass the threshold to having PTSD, and there are many sub-threshold levels of reactions that people have, but once you have basically all of the symptoms necessary to have PTSD, it becomes rather disabling. Um, what seems to be the case is that it's, it's both an anxiety disorder and a mood disorder. So it's no longer in either categories in the diagnostic manual. It has a category of its own because both sets of symptoms are present in virtually all um, of the patients who have PTSD. And that does make it somewhat unique. The big issue for PTSD, and really kind of why I became exposed to psychological trauma, is that it's often associated with other forms of what we call in mental health comorbidities. And these comorbidities um, typically look like alcohol abuse and drug abuse and other kinds of problems. But in the main, the, the scientific literature suggests that people are drinking and they're using drugs in an effort to medicate. So it's a self-medication uh, because the symptoms are so severe. And you know the anxiety and the depression, the sleep problems, which appear to be very difficult um, for people to manage, um, are often um, things that, are, uh, that remain even after successful treatment, that people have trouble sleeping, whether it's the nightmares or um, or night terrors sometimes in, in some patients, but all of which make it a very disabling condition. And it's something that I think, um, something I deeply appreciate is that public policy in the VA really changed towards the issue and the matter of PTSD during my career. And the changes occurred really starting in the mid 1980s. and. Um, I, you know, it's just so encouraging for me to travel to remote outposts in VA when we did travel um, and to see, you know, a collection of outstanding young psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers who have become incredibly well versed in the methods of evaluating and treating people with PTSD. The VA is clearly the yep. international leader in this arena. And I will say there was, you know, back in the early parts of this war, um, there was a presidential commission on the care of uh, veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan. And I remember being questioned by um, some of the leaders of the, um, um, of the panel that was, you know, sent all over the country to talk with experienced people. And, um, you know, the notion by one of the leaders was, well, why can't the public sector do this, Terry? And there's no reason why the public sector can't be every bit right. as good. 
it'll just take them 20 years yeah. to marshal up for the education and the training, all of which have been a part of VA for as long as I've been. I've been training um, interns and residents and, um, and social work interns um, for much of my career. Nursing service um, all want to know something about PTC. And that, to me, is so encouraging mm -hmm. to see this commitment to understanding that uh, the mind and the body are not separate. If the mind is struggling, the body is struggling. If the body is struggling, the mind reacts. So all of these things lead, have led to VA having this incredible commitment. Um, today we hear it as whole health, you know, the whole health programs. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 you know, the mind-body dualism that existed in the past. People really have, um, have rejected that notion and have seen that there is um, an important way of viewing psychological trauma, its responses, which we call PTSD, and its effects both on people's um, families, their communities, um, and their physical health as well. These are all very well documented now. Fantastic work, and it really shows a correlation between a, nom a normalization of the conversations about PTSD to where every American knows that PTSD does exist, and it's not just in somebody's head as it was said so many years for, for combat veterans like myself to say that it's just in your head and it's not the case any longer and it's because of work for you and your colleagues. Yeah, well, there's a large group of people responsible for this yeah. change. I was certainly there amongst many people, but my colleague in Vermont, now retired, Matt Friedman, was um, very important. Bob Rosenheck in Connecticut, another um, very important contributor to the literature. Patricia Riesick, who's now at Duke, who spent time um, in Boston with us here, um, all making very important contributions to the evaluation of the treatment of PTSD. But it takes, it, it takes a much larger number of people than a village to change public policy. Yeah. But it's happened. It and has. Jen, I'll tell, I'll tell you one other thing too, which is so interesting to me, again, having the advantage of you know, a 40 plus year, 43 or four year um, time, uh, timeline in VA, what really changed the dialogue about psychological trauma were the attacks on New York and Boston and the Pentagon. Um, when those planes took off from Logan Airport here and crashed into either the field or uh, the, um, the Pentagon or the World Trade Center towers, the word psychological trauma was on everyone's right. lips. Everybody it was, was experiencing it. Right? Everybody was experiencing yeah. it. Everybody knew it. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was a pivotal time. It was. Um, I didn't have to explain to people when someone would say, well, what do you do? I'd say the National Center for PTSD. Their response would be, oh, that's great. Yes. I didn't know there was such a thing. Yeah. Um, as opposed to, what was that acronym? You know, P -T -S right. yeah. yeah. So uh, that was a big uh, watershed mark. And that's 20 years ago. Um, Hard to believe. Long time. Yeah, so things do change. Yeah. Public policy changes. Public perception changes. And... Um, from my vantage point, science drives all of that. And you know, as a clinical psychologist, as the director of um, uh, this division of the National Center for PTSD um, here in Boston, um, this has been the objective, was to not only improve the treatments and the methods of evaluating people for psychological trauma, but to also have it span the entire um, healthcare system in which we're involved. And, it, it is so deeply encouraging to me to see a lot of the young scientists who are coming along yeah. doing great things, um, who are in their 30s, um, and then the sort of like the old guys still trying to um, um, have at it um, <laughs> well into their 60s. Well, you've done a great job. Um, so what's the correlation between PTSD and TBI, and how do those two things kind of maybe interact or you know, negatively interact with each other? Um, so now you're bringing up um, a sore subject for me. Okay. So um, I think that I am guilty of having ignored the issue of how common mild traumatic brain injury is in a war zone. And it really wasn't until these wars sort of emerged 20 years ago that these improvised explosive devices right. with, that are remotely um, detonated and the impact of these devices on people emerged so clearly in my mind. And, you know, I sat some days with my head in my hands saying, 
how could we have missed this? That there would be potentially um, biological sequelae, mm -hmm. such as shell shock, which we kind of um, snickered at a little bit because we thought that was code for psychological problems right, right. in the old days. But the shell shock was the shells were like battering people that were exploding nearby. And to me, when a shell or an improvised explosive device is detonated and people are thrown a long distance or not, but they've experienced this detonation, it is simultaneously a potential brain injury and an emotional injury. So that PTSD and mild traumatic brain injury can occur concurrently in potentially large numbers of people. And so we have a group here in VA Boston that's not part of my research center, but a group that we work very closely with that is very interested in um, the neuropsychological concomitants of um, exposure to these blast injuries. It's called TRACS, Translational Research Center in Trauma and Stress, um, headed by Gina McGlinchey and Bill Milberg. And um, uh, this work is looking very carefully at um, uh, neuroimaging, neuropsychological testing, psychological testing. They use the same things that uh, our group developed, mm -hmm. um, looking at genetics to see why does one person and not another get this condition? So um, I think we're going to be learning a lot more about the interaction of traumatic, mild traumatic brain injury and PTSD um, as the studies emerge. And this is a, a big research center funded by VA's rehab R&D um, in an amazingly supportive way so that we can get to the bottom of what is happening uh, to people who concurrently have PTSD and mild traumatic brain injury. Wow. So you have a physical component as well as an emotional component. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's right. And mild traumatic brain injury can, you know, the, the, the actual injury can be um, modest in scope, but the brain consists of tracks right. of circuits. And if the circuitry is disrupted, if the circuitry is injured or impaired, what are the implications of that? Does it lead to a reduction in brain size, you know, cortical size, cortical thickness, or is it responsible for changes in like the hippocampus, which has been implied or insinuated in the past about PTSD? How do these things work? There's a lot more to, uh, to be learned. And uh, we have groups here in VA Boston uh, that are working very hard at tr uh, trying to unravel this very complicated picture. Let's talk a little bit about treatment. Um, you mentioned several different things, so maybe you could describe a little bit about um, the different treatments that there are for PTSD and maybe even like kind of the success rates of that or how we really get to success in a treatment of PTSD. Right, so um, there, there are probably five or six approaches to psychotherapy that um, we consider to be evidence-based right now. Um, not all of these treatments have been tried in large-scale clinical trials in uh, veterans, but many have. Um, back in the late 70s, we started work on um, exposure therapy, which is now considered to be the gold um, uh, treatment for uh, people with uh, PTSD. The gold standard is exposure therapy. And we published the first randomized clinical trial, you know, sort of that's the gold standard for evidence in, uh, in healthcare. We've published the first clinical trial demonstrating that Vietnam theater veterans with PTSD that at the time was um, 15 or more years old um, could respond and could um, um, do well um, for, I think the follow-up was six months after we completed treatment. These folks were doing very, very well. And that became actually the treatment of choice for women who have been sexually assaulted, for women who have been exposed to violence of all sorts. Um, and my colleague in, at the University of Pennsylvania, Edna Foa, published literally dozens of studies um, on, on this topic, um, mostly in um, women who had been exposed to violence. Um, when this war broke out, she and others began to work on um, extrapolating what she had learned with women 
applying exposure therapy to combat veterans in large numbers, whether they were in active duty military mm -hmm. um, posts or they were in um, VA. Um, so exposure therapy is really the, the, the treatment of choice. And we think somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 percent of people do really well. Wow. 50 to 60 percent do really well. Um, another treatment, I, I mentioned Patricia Riesick, who's now at Duke, who worked for um, a 10 or so years at um, Boston. Um, she developed a treatment 30 years ago called cognitive processing therapy. And it is seen as the sort of second most um, evidence-based treatment. And cognitive processing therapy is to try to identify what the challenges are that people are experiencing in their views, their attitudes, and their beliefs about the traumatic event itself, and challenging those that are either irrational or overblown or catastrophic when they don't need to be. Um, and that treatment has been very successful both in, um, um, in women who have been sexually assaulted and in combat veterans. Um, and so those are the two premier treatments. But there are others that are out there. And VA, remarkably, has done an amazing job in trying to educate the mental health workforce in at least these two forms of evidence-based treatment. They've been around the longest, and VA is doing a really wonderful job in getting this information out to the workforce. Because not everybody gets trained in these areas right. um, in their graduate training programs in psychiatry, psychology, or, or social work. So um, VA has taken it upon itself to, um, to try to up um, the skill level of uh, all of the new people who are coming in with this interest in treating trauma. Wow. It, so I guess that's a simplistic question is, is PTSD curable? I think in many cases it is. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll tell you, this is sort of a, an interesting story. I don't know how funny it is, but um, in the very early 1980s, it could have been 79, 80 or so, there was a World War II veteran who came to our treatment program, which by the way was clearly uh, labeled Vietnam Veteran Program. Okay. <laughs> and so this gentleman sort of walked in and um, he um, had been at the VA and hospitalized many, many, many times. This would have been 79, 80. World War II ended in 45. So you know um, how many years this has been. And he'd been a, a faithful user of the VA healthcare system. And he told us a dramatic story of him being a naval um, a, a, a naval uh, guy um, on a ship that was torpedoed um, and um, that um, everything was filling with water and he thought this, this was all over. And there were other gruesome aspects to it that are unnecessary for this purpose. But he um, had been treated at that VA medical center for decades, literally. And we one day just on a quirk after we successfully treated him using exposure therapy we asked for his entire medical record this is pre-electronic right. medical records and uh, his medical record was literally that tall off the table his medical record for the next three years was that tall. well and we used that as convincing evidence sort of ecologically valid evidence works. But the treatment, we had other measures yeah. too, but that's the impact that you can have yeah. on people's lives. And there were so many other cases of mine and my trainees and fellows and so forth that point to the fact that um, we can really remediate things. There's always lingering stuff, but people are usually so grateful for the care. Um, I will um, tell you that um, Another case that I treated um, you know, many years ago, um, where the wife of the veteran came in, which was a rare and unusual thing. Um, she came in, and I was a little worried that she was going to say, you know, he's really doing very badly at home, and I wish you would stop whatever you were doing. And I said, um, nice to see you, Mrs. So-and-so. And -so. And I said, what can I do? And she said, I don't know what you're doing, but whatever it is, keep it up. He hasn't been this good since he returned from Vietnam. And this would have been well into the 80s. So, you know, um, the data substantiate that 
uh, people do quite well after um, a successful course of this treatment. Um, but there are many reasons why people can't get treatment. You know, um, part of it is the fact that uh, we are a regional system. Um, and what many people are trying to do right now, which I think is the next wave, and we're very involved in this right now, is trying to use the internet and trying to use other ways of gaining access. So many years ago now, it would be 12 years ago, we were funded by the National Institute of Health, Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, um, to develop a web-based treatment for veterans who had PTSD and high-risk Alcohol use, alcohol use. And um, we've been working on this program for now a dozen years. The impact of this, we ran a randomized con uh, controlled trial, um, 600 people in this project drawn from all over the map. Picture the map and it's all filled with red dots of people who accessed our internet-based treatment. This is called vet change and it was remarkably successful in um, in reducing alcohol use and reducing PTSD. So there are lots of things we can do. We, 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 we just need to be vigilant about the changing needs of the veterans and the veteran population. So, And I think the changes through the pandemic as well as we get into telehealth and telemental health and other opportunities that might be out there are totally, great. Totally, totally. I think, I think the pandemic has taught us so much about work about healthcare, care, right. et cetera. It's, it's um, shocking what we're trying to put together these days and um, you know, trying to figure out what the next um, uh, work environment actually looks like. Yeah, and, right. you, know, you see here in Lafayette City Center what we think yeah. it looks like, but we got started on this actually pre-pandemic. And uh, as it turns out, it may be really useful for how we think of work today. Yeah, and not only how, how you look at work, but also how care can be provided in a whole different modules than ever had been done before or even thought of before. Totally, totally. And wh whatever is the case, I, I am absolutely assured, and I have been saying this since we established Vet Change, that the, the answer to many of the um, problems and gaps in the delivery of mental health care is in our hands. It is our cell phone. It is the future. We have to figure out ways of making it very secure so that uh, people can feel confident. But there's so much power in these cell phones that um, I think it, it holds answers to um, many of the problems and solves many of the gaps that we've had in the delivery of care. You know, we're here in Boston, John. We're seven hours from Aristook, Maine, which is still in our network. Right. Seven hours. Yeah. Uh, people can't come to the National Center for PTSD for a one hour. Um, weekly session. That's not viable. Thankfully, we have incredibly competent people in the main um, area. But we need to figure out how the expertise that exists in the National Center and the breakthroughs that we have can actually be spread across the spread system. Yeah. Quickly, yeah. quickly. Yeah. And we're working on it. We're trying our best to do it. And, you know, it'll take time. It will. Are there any ongoing PTSD clinical trials or is there something upcoming that you're looking forward to doing? Um, well, so in 2013, um, um, President Obama um, created uh, the President's um, um, National Research Action Plan. And in the context of this National Research Action Plan uh, was a focus on PTSD and a separate focus, separate focus in 2013 on TBI. And so um, work, what was created were two um, very large centers of excellence, one to focus on PTSD, one to focus on um, MTBI. Um, and the focus on MTBI was in Richmond, Virginia with David Sifu. And the focus on PTSD was, um, um, on, that was in Boston and University of Texas at San Antonio where my colleague, Alan Peterson, uh, Stacy Young and Barbara Niles here in Boston and myself led this um, sort of unified effort to treat PTSD in, um, um, in both active duty um, and, um, um, and veteran patients. And so we have finished um, about uh, 11 clinical trials wow. um, 
and um, some of them are now just coming into the publication realm. And uh, there are things that I'm very pleased with. Intensive outpatient program that's reduced discharges um, from the active duty military. Um, that project headed by Alan Peterson, myself. Um, but also looking at whether transcranial stimulation, transcranial stimulation, um, that's specifically in circuits, brain circuits that mm -hmm. we know are involved in anxiety and mood, if that accompanying psychotherapies um, will show a better out outcome than not. Um, the largest clinical trial on post-traumatic headache and PTSD um, just completed, that's hopefully gonna be under review in the next couple of weeks. And then um, one of our trainees, Stephanie Fredman, who's now at Penn State University, did a really very innovative, creative um, delivery of um, care for veterans and their spouses. In some cases, the spouse was a male. In some cases, the spouse mm -hmm. was a female. Uh, these were married couples that were undergoing incredible stress and distress. And she did a weekend treatment program for these couples. And this weekend treatment program down in uh, the Fort Hood area, mm -hmm. Um, uh, in Texas, this weekend treatment program starting on Friday late afternoon and going to Sunday afternoon had a very strong impact, favorable impact wow. on both PTSD but also the marital relationship, which marriages break apart sure. commonly in people who have PTSD. So um, these are just, that's just a sampling. Wow. And there are many other projects that are coming, and these are just now beginning to reach the scientific literature. We're very excited by this. It was a tremendous investment. Oh, the VA, Clinical Sciences Research and Development, um, um, and um, the DOD both pooled their money um, to create the infrastructure for running all of these randomized controlled trials. They were all powered properly. That's a scientific term. They were big enough yeah. um, so that we could draw strong conclusions. Yeah. Um, and, um, and they were delivered by, the treatments were delivered by really conscientious, competent uh, uh, clinical psychologists in the main, sometimes psychiatrists. So uh, that's coming, that's coming out in probably within the year, hopefully, if they're accepted. That's exciting. Yeah. Well, we've come to the end of our time and really enjoyed your conversation and getting to know about you and your great work throughout the years and all the your uh, teams that have uh, helped you with that and helped uh, the system and helped our veterans. So. Anything you wanted to close with before, uh, before we move on? Well, I'll just say that, you know, I'm 44 years now. Next week, it'll be 44 years in VA. And um, while it has never been what I would call an easy tour, um, <laughs> it, it, it has been a pleasure to work in this healthcare system for this long. And it's a healthcare system that provided me with so many different opportunities um, to succeed. And, and every step where I needed help or assistance whether it was from the chief of staff at the institution or the director, um, they were able to deliver in ways that convinced me that everybody was working towards the betterment of the health of these veterans. And so I, I do want to thank um, my immediate boss now is a guy named Michael Charnes, professor of neurology at um, Harvard Medical School, who has entrusted me with tremendous resources. Um, uh, the director of VA Boston, a gentleman who's been around for a while also, whose name is Vincent Ng, uh, remarkably supportive. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I do like to say periodically that, um, you know, Vince has been with us for eight or so years as, as the director here, and every single decision he's made where I was in the middle of it, <laughs> he decided in the favor of research. That's good. <laughs> That's awesome. And I may, I may be tempting fate yeah. by even well, no, announcing well, that, so. but um, um, I am a short timer. Right? Well. Thanks again for all your work. Thanks, it was great to meet you. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. A huge thank you to all of you for listening, to Dr. Keen for his time, Vision One for hosting us, and our broadcast and production team for their support. Join us for our next episode where we get a chance to chat with Dr. Eric Schumacher, Army veteran and VHA's whole health clinical advisor. See you then.